Hey everyone, this is Mason Hutchison, and you're listening to Herb Rally, your daily herbal podcast. We come out with new episodes about five days a week, so be sure to tune in often. Our goal for the show is to help you along your herbalist journey no matter what stage you're at. We have over 684 episodes, so feel free to peruse those episodes and you're bound to find something of interest. This episode is yet another edition of the Herbalist Hour, and I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie, also known as the Trauma-Informed Herbalist. We had an informative and wide-ranging discussion about the polyvagal theory, aromatherapy, somatics and plant medicine, how trauma can affect the body, recommended resources, and a whole lot more. So long-time Herb Rally listeners may know that uh, Elizabeth has actually provided a a few episodes now. Um, She recorded specifically for the Herb Rally podcast. I also want to encourage you to go check out, if you enjoyed today's show, uh, go check out Elizabeth's podcast as well by the name of The Trauma-Informed Herbalist, uh, and she has a book by the same name as well. Uh, Of course, links to all that will be in the show notes. So also want to let you know that Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie, the guest on the show, also has an upcoming Shift Network uh, free video course coming up. Uh, There's still time to register, and in this hour-long online event, You'll gain an understanding of how choosing the right plants based on your connection to them can accelerate your healing. You'll participate in an inner garden sanctuary, guided visualization practice to relax and possibly receive a message from your plant allies. You'll discover that nature invites you to slow down and listen to your innermost guidance in order to heal and thrive, uh, and a whole lot more. I won't, I won't read you the whole landing page, but I'll leave a link to uh, the free hour-long event in the show notes. Uh, it's happening in a couple days, um, August 8th, 2023. Uh, it might be available after the fact, too, but yeah, learn more, check it out, uh, click on the link there. Uh, we also chat a bit about the online event uh, in this conversation. Also, before we get to the show, I want to tell you about the Botanic Wise Women's Herbal Gathering that's happening September 15th to the 17th, 2023. It's the 13th annual event, and it's held in uh, the Kempton Community Center in Kempton, Pennsylvania. And it's coming up in about 40 days. Uh, Again, that's September 15th to the 17th, 2023, and Herbrella is a proud sponsor of the event. So uh, learn more. I will leave a link to that event in the show notes. Otherwise, you can just go to botanicwise.com to learn more. A couple other random things I want to let you know about before we get into the show. Uh, If you're not already subscribed to us on YouTube, I would recommend you do so. Uh, We've been coming out with new videos each and every day. Uh, Seven days a week, a new video on our YouTube channel, all uh, herbalism or herbalist related. Uh, I also wanted to let you know if you're enjoying these Herbalist Hour interviews, a lot of the times um, the Herbalist Hour, well, actually every time the Herbalist Hour comes out first on the YouTube channel. So if you want early access to these Herbalist Hour episodes, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just for instance, this was released on, uh, this was released about two weeks ago, this episode. So uh, it's coming out a full two weeks later after the fact um, on our uh, podcast platform. So, so yeah, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get early access to these Herbalist Hour interviews. Also, if you want to take it a step further, uh, our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members are actually able to join us live uh, during the Zoom call uh, to actually participate in the Herbalist Hour. We've had uh, some of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members join us for these conversations. It's always uh, fun to have someone in the audience, and uh, it's even more fun when they ask questions and interact and whatnot. So, so if you'd like to learn more about the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, you'd go to herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Uh, it's only $10 a month, but if you'd like to try your first 30 days for free, you could use coupon code podcast at checkout. And yeah, in addition to being able to join the Herbalist Hours live, uh, there's al- there's other membership perks, including like, say, uh, herbal community discounts to places like Mountain Rose Herbs and whatnot. There's a bunch of classes in there. I think we counted we're over about 60-ish classes now with uh, over 15 different highly esteemed herbalists, uh, and that just continues to grow. Uh, the, the available library of content continues to grow. So, And again, it's one of the best ways you can help support the Herb Rally podcast and all that we do here at Herb Rally. So a uh, huge thank you and shout out to all of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. It really means a lot to us. So uh, that's going to do it with my rambling today. That was a lot. So I uh, hope you enjoy today's episode of the Herbalist Hour with Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie, a.k.a. the Trauma-Informed Herbalist. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. 
Same. Yeah. And I got to just say right off the bat, uh, Elizabeth has provided numerous podcast episodes for the Herbalay podcast in the past. So just big thanks for that. Um, so I'm excited to get to know you a little bit more uh, via the interview. So uh, let's start with how did you get into this whole herbalism thing? I grew up um, with a mom and a grandmother that were really into herbs. And I didn't know that you could have a career in it. You know, obviously at the farm, like we had a lot of different herbs that grandmother and mom both kept in their gardens. And <laughs> it like I just didn't I, it never occurred to me that this could be a profession. My mom was into some of the plant medicines for the chronic illness that she had. And as a matter of fact, between using some herbs and some of the nutrition choices, she was able to alleviate a lot of the chronic pain she was having. So I was really impressed upon by a really early age that there's something to this, like plant medicine works. And it, But it wasn't until I got out of Florence, Alabama. I love Florence, but it's a little smaller area. And in the 90s, you know, not many people were into that in that area. And when I realized getting into my college years, realizing that this is actually people do this as a career, I got really excited and started pursuing, like, how do you study this? How do you get into this deeper? Um, and it's just been such a powerful thing. And from the trauma side of things, I was a 911 dispatcher as my day job for quite a while. And um, so that by itself is kind of a form of secondary trauma. And then I became a victim of intimate partner violence. And after that, I started responding differently to some of the natural things. So meditation, certain adaptogens bothered me. And I began to realize like something is off about this. And of course, initially the response was, it must be me. My body must be broken. Um, and it took me a long time to dig deeper into this. And when I finally started to realize it's not that my body is broken, it's that my nervous system is responding differently to the herbs. So now how do I adjust that based on my needs in order to start the healing process again? Well, I'm excited to delve in more into, say, the polyvagal theory later on yes. and, and your um, experience with, say, adaptogens versus calming nervines. And uh, I would like to eventually know what kind of um, um, herbal protocols you personally follow and some of your personal plant allies and if you've kind of found finally found like a, um, a happy medium with some of these herbs you're taking. But um, um, can you explain to the audience what exactly is uh, trauma-informed herbalism? Yes. So trauma-informed herbalism is, is really, a, it's not as much about, oh, let's fix the person. It's more about understanding how trauma can change somebody's response. Trauma is defined as the response that the body and the brain have after a, an event that feels overwhelming to that person. So for instance, I may sit through the same event as you, yeah. but my nervous system based on my past experiences may actually cause me to feel overwhelmed by the event. Whereas you may not have the same past experiences and you may not have the same overwhelm. So then all of a sudden I'm dealing with trauma, residual trauma after the event, Whereas you just went, oh, well, you know, water off a duck's back, go on, right? So one of the things that I'm really trying to impress upon people is that people respond to these events differently. They may respond to herbs in ways that we don't expect. You know, when we look at herbs and we look at, look at the way that things normally go, you expect people to have good results from certain adaptogens. You expect people to uh, you know, feel great after certain nerve veins. And when they don't respond that way, there can be kind of a, a sense of like, well, you must not be doing something right. But if we understand mm -hmm. trauma may be involved in these scenarios, it becomes less about, oh, well, I have a bunch of non-compliant clients and right. more about we need to adjust the protocols to help support this person as they're healing and their nervous system is trying to rebalance. One thing I love about uh, love about herbalists in general is uh, I, I feel like we look at individuals as individuals, and um, right. you know, and and um, and it sounds like that kind of comes through a lot in your work, not just with the herbs, but uh, being trauma informed. Um, so I, I really appreciate that um, because yeah, we all have our own unique um, experiences, and um, I, I feel like a lot of your work is just based in 
empathy, uh, which I really love. And um, it kind of reminds me of when I first started um, taking Blue Vervain. Um, I was very um, effective on me uh, in a positive way. And I'm like, I guess I'm a Blue Vervain person. And, you know, Skullcap never really had uh, that appeal to me. And uh, I just, it, it kind of reminded me of what you were saying right there. I'm like, oh yeah, certain herbs um, are better for certain people for whatever reason going on there. But um, uh, can you explain how trauma affects the body? So trauma is first and foremost stored in the nervous system. When you're looking at somebody has been through trauma, you are looking at the root cause is in the nervous system. Now we may have effects in other body systems, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that root is either there's memories, the brain is part of the nervous system. So there may be memories happening or more commonly it's stored somewhere deeper in the physical body. And once we recognize that and start to bring in herbs that can support the nervous system, as well as this is getting a little off the herbalist train here, but getting Please into do. some of the, <laughs> the somatics work, some of the movement therapies, listening to really what's happening in your body, then you're kind of, you're kind of giving yourself a chance to, to listen to what the nervous system needs. And so that's where I get into some of the somatic herbalism type work. And of course my, my stuff's herbal somatics, but I do a lot of that because it's not just always about, Oh, here, take these plants. This is what works based on your energetic pattern. Sometimes it's here are some plants that could work. Let's listen to what our body is saying and see what we're being drawn to. Um, and so that's a side of it that I think is really important for people to recognize, because when you're dealing with the nervous system, you can have all kinds of wacky symptoms to come up. Mm. Um, some people have pain. Some people have weird tics. Some people will feel dizzy. Some people will feel a sense of anxiousness or depression. There's all kinds of different things that can come up. And so it really does become a lot of the times a matter of listening to your body and seeing what helps. Now, what happens, remember I said the nervous system is the root cause, but there's a cascade of events that then affects things like the digestive system, the immune system, it, really any system from there could be affected, but those are the two big ones. And so when we're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, which we'll get into with polyvagal theory when you get when we get to that point, but stick with me here, parasympathetic nervous system, a lot of it is related to the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve kind of runs from the base of your skull down through beside your heart. It controls some of the, the functions of the heart and it wanders the whole way down into the digestive system. And that's why it's called vagus or the wandering nerve. And this nerve is very important when we're talking about trauma and support. And a lot of the times somebody who's been through trauma, because this nerve wanders the whole way down to the digestive system there will be digestive components. I mean, even if you don't have trauma, even if you've just been under significant emotional strain, you a lot of people have digestive responses to that. Um, so yeah, that's a thing. And then of course we have the, the connection between inflammation and trauma that's being researched and studied. So there's a lot of interesting it's not interesting when you're dealing with it, but like from a scientific perspective, <laughs> yeah. like I say that and I'm like, yeah, but then it's like, oh, it's not really, but like it is from a scientific perspective, sure. it yeah. can be really interesting to see these links. And then from a more practical perspective, like some of the stuff that I dealt with and, and a lot of my clients have dealt with, you know, recognizing that that trauma may be part of why this autoimmune issue has popped up can give us another level of things to work on while we're also addressing like what imbalances are happening on the autoimmune level. Great. Uh, very well said. Um, I just heard you on a podcast yesterday in preparation for the show. And I want to say it was more around the um, psychology or therapy side. And um, it was funny. A lot of the episode was you essentially explaining herbalism to the host. And I kind of, this is called the herbalist hour, but I really like to, yeah, like we could veer away from it. So I'm glad that we're talking more about this side of things, it, it really is all connected. And like you said, if we're having emotional trauma, we might have say diarrhea or constipation or some sort of a yeah digestive upset. But, um, uh, 
Well, let's see. I, I was going to bring up the polyvagal theory next, but actually I am kind of curious what your practice looks like. Are you a practicing clinical herbalist? And um, how do you kind of throw in this, uh, this, uh, the trauma aspect? Cause I know I'm pretty sure you're not a therapist. Um, I'm so not a you, therapist. Yeah, so you, yeah, <laughs> I'm not you're, a therapist. You're an MD, right? You're a naturopathic doctor? Or? No, I am. Oh. I have a PhD. So my PhD oh, okay. is in natural medicine. Gotcha. Um, but I am not a naturopath. That was my I original see. goal. I so see. I had, yeah, I had gone into it planning to become a naturopathic physician um, and essentially funds limited our ability to move to Seattle. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, Best so year. I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah. Best year was my number one choice. Um, okay. but that's okay. Like, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so I refocused into a PhD on natural medicine where I was able to write several papers, really kind of get in depth into some of the, the, the naturopathic psychology side of things is so my natural medicine degree is in naturopathic psychology. Um, I am a clinical herbalist, but I'm also a registered yoga teacher. Um, and I also have studied somatics and am currently in a professional somatic training program. So my, my clinic is more a combination of some of the herbalism, some of that, like reconnecting people to their body. A lot of the times what I do, as a matter of fact, I was just doing a, a conversation the other day with another interview and somebody said, so you kind of get people into the zip code, like you find the zip code and then narrow it down through somatics. And I was like, yes, that's it. So like, for instance, with you, like blue vervain and skull cap, I probably would have said, let's sit down with both of these plants mm -hmm. and let's just give you a minute to see if you're uh, attracted to one of them. Maybe try the tincture of both and see if one of them really resonates with you, listening to your body and your intuition. And you probably would have been, you know, drawn to the blue vervain. And so there's some of that that comes into play instead of me just handing somebody a sheet that says, here are the things you need to take. Um, and then, of course, there's yoga and that kind of thing as well. So you said you moved from a small town. Was it Florence, Alabama? Yes. Uh, yes. And where are you living now? I'm in Birmingham, so Birmingham, not so. like a whole lot bigger, but big enough. That's, um, that's a pretty big town, right? A hundred some thousand, maybe. Yeah, it's 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 one of the biggest in the state, but yeah, I've, dri I've driven through that town, uh, that city. And I, I love that area. That's so oh. gorgeous, such a beautiful plant life and everything. And uh, yeah, what a, so I, I, I take it. There's a more receptive folks there to this type of uh, healing. Well, and now, and I would say now in Florence, there are as well. Oh, cool. But I left Florence at age 15. Okay. Um, <laughs> like I went to, to high school in Mobile, Alabama. And so when I left, that's been, you know, over 15, almost 20 years ago now. And so like when I left at that time, it just wasn't as prevalent now. Like a lot, I've got a lot of friends in Florence that are into it. Eventually I would love to move back there. Um, cool. But I am happy where we are now. We are in the city limits of Birmingham and we're five minutes from the botanical gardens. Oh, so lovely. like I'm in a very happy place for work. <laughs> I love that. Well, uh, why don't we dive into polyvagal theory? So what is polyvagal theory? Polyvagal theory was created by Dr. Stephen Porges. He is a medical doctor who was, I, I want to say the first time he noticed it, he was working in a neo, neo, neonatal <laughs> ICU. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so he was working in the NICU and there were there were doctors that would watch heart rate variability to determine how resilient the, the infants were. But then there were other signs, and now I couldn't tell you exactly what they were. Maybe it was heart rate specifically that could indicate whether or not an infant was about to be in trouble. So both of these things, the heart rate variability and the other, I, I do believe it was like a, a real low bradycardia type heart rate. Both of these signs of resilience and, you know, impending doom <laughs> come from the vagus nerve being activated. And so this creates kind of a conundrum because on one side, it sounds like if the vagus nerve is activated, that means that you're building resilience. On the other side, if the vag vagus nerve is activated, then something must be wrong. And so he started trying to dig a little deeper to figure it out. And that's how he created the polyvagal theory. Now, a lot of herbalists have heard of sympathetic versus parasympathetic. 
Sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. In the polyvagal theory, sympathetic is still your fight or flight. That is still where you get like when you're feeling like you've got to move, you can, you know, the jittery sensations like the in, in kind of herbal energetics terms, it's adding heat or adding energy to the system. But then from the parasympathetic angle, he breaks it into two pieces, thus polyvagal, right? Multiple vagal. You have your ventral vagal and your dorsal vagal. The dorsal vagal response is that shutdown. It's the, from kind of an energetic standpoint, the energy has completely left the system. It's a collapse. Whereas ventral vagal is actually where we're trying to get. We are trying to get back to a point where we are feel comfortable, soothed, maybe a little bit of an unwinding and relaxing feeling. And then we're able to connect with each other. And the ventral vagal is really where that rest and digest comes into play. When we are in a ventral vagal state, we're in a place where we are more connected to each other, but we're also, our physiology is in a state of healing, of rebuilding. Whereas if you're in fight or flight, or if you're in dorsal vagal, there tends to be a lot of survival mode going on and your body's just trying to get through it. So a lot of the work that I do is helping people recognize when they're going into one or the other and what herbs and movement medicine call to them in those moments to help to bring that system back into balance where they can be in the ventral vagal state more often. And that's very simplistic, but that is the general goal. Hey everyone, it's Mason. Just a quick interruption from the show to let you know about our 13 herbal freebies. If you go to herbrally.com on the navigation bar at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says freebies. Just click there and you'll sign up for our email newsletter. And in exchange, we're offering 13 herbal freebies. That's eBooks, webinars, videos, downloadable audio, and discounts to cool herbal companies. So if you'd like to check out these freebies as well as sign up for our email newsletter, we update you about uh, current events, new monographs, new videos, etc. Just go to herbrally.com and click on the button at the top of the page that simply says freebies. Okay, that's it for me. Now back to the show. Yeah, so we were talking about individuals as individuals earlier. Is there any examples of protocols that you could help people get into that 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 sweet spot um yeah maybe just a story or something like that because i'm i'm picturing it as you're t- teaching and i'm like but but what do you do you know how do you get right. there uh, yeah so do you have any examples i'll use myself as an example please <laughs> so when i was um i had just kind of gotten out of the intimate partner violence situation and i started having a lot of physical responses i ended up in the er at one point with a an allergic reaction. They never could quite figure out what happened. They gave me some EpiPens and said, good luck. Uh, That was not a good feeling. And it was, and I was trying to turn to the medicine to help me like the the herbs, like what can I use? Because none of the conventional side of things was really giving me answers. And one of the herbs that I used to use a lot before my trauma was rhodiola. And so I got some more rhodiola and started taking it and started having worse panic attacks. And rhodiola is an energizing adaptogen. And I was in a sympathetic nervous system state. So remember what I said with sympathetic, that's your fight or flight. That's the extra energy. We're adding energy to a system that already has energy. And it was spinning me out even further. So instead, I shifted to some other things like holy basil, which has some adaptogenic properties and is really balancing. Um, And then for a while, I was using some magnesium, which isn't herbs, but the magnesium was really helpful as far as just like helping to soothe the system and kind of allow it to relax back into a place where I could feel a little bit more calm and connected. So it was a very big difference for me where rhodiola was really, it, now it's very helpful because I'm kind of back in a place where I'm a little more balanced. Mm. But at the time, it was actually making those symptoms worse. Now, I have clients who naturally tend to fall more into the dorsal vagal collapse side of things, and rhodiola is their best 
friend. They may have even gone through something very similar to me, but their nervous system and the energies that have occurred in the nervous system have them in a slightly different trauma response. And so Rhodiola becomes their friend and they're able to use that to help kind of bring them back into the, um, the ventral vagal state. So it's a lot of that kind of thing. And people who have complex trauma, it gets more complex. Sure. So in complex trauma, we have different sources for the trauma. And so depending on the, what's causing the activation, some people may always go into the sympathetic. Some people may always go into dorsal vagal, but sometimes depending on the person's situation, they may find themselves in sympathetic some days and in dorsal vagal other days. And so that's where it really becomes, okay, let's get you some plans for sympathetic. Let's get you some plans for dorsal vagal. And now we're going to really notice what's happening and take it based on what we've got going on. So you mentioned complex trauma, um, and I would ask you to define the, but before we get there, um, I've heard of uh, something called implicit versus explicit memory, I want to say. Um, and I, I, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, implicit is more like pre-memory childhood trauma. Does that sound familiar? Or uh, I, for whatever reason, my brain is associating implicit trauma with complex trauma. And I don't know if that's remotely true or can you speak to any of that or define the complex trauma? Yeah. So I don't actually know much about those phrases, implicit okay. versus explicit memory. Um, I will say that there is uh, one of the things that is really interesting to me is that when we get into a lot of this type of work with, with plant medicine and somatics and kind of like bringing together like a, um, a, an honoring of the body's innate wisdom is what it boils down to really like allowing ourselves to recognize that like, we're going to get through this. And if we connect with what our body is telling us, it will be a little bit of a smoother ride. Yeah. And there's two different approaches that you'll hear people talk about that's top down processing and bottom up processing. And the phrase top down and bottom up comes from a little bit of an outdated model, the triune brain model. But the idea in top down processing is that we're using the neocortex to logically process through what's occurring. And it's essentially filtering down to our brain stem to those more primal instincts, the fight or flight, that kind of thing, and, and using our logic to help soothe what's occurring in the body, which is helpful in a lot of ways. There's a lot of talk therapy that does that, and that's good, and that, but that's one piece. We also need the bottom-up processing, and bottom-up is kind of the opposite. It's listening to the body, not necessarily trying to understand why it's doing what it's doing, right? Sometimes we know, oh, okay, I'm feeling this sensation and this is why. Sometimes we may not know. It may be something left over from childhood or like some people are even traumatized as they're being born. If it's a very difficult birth, like the child can ha hold trauma from being born. And so you're not going to remember that. That's not going to be part of your logic processing. But if we can use things like tapping into that innate wisdom that's in the body through somatics and through connecting with plant allies and finding things that really sing to us, then we are honoring that bottom up processing where we're um, kind of unraveling some of the blocks that are occurring in the body. And then all of a sudden our thinking becomes clearer. So I, that's not the same thing necessarily as implicit and explicit memory, but that's kind of the kind of thing that I work with because I don't have to know what somebody's situation is. I don't have to know their backstory. A lot of the times I have people that come to me who don't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll eventually tell me a little bit about what, what has happened, but like a lot of people don't, I, I don't really know what's occurred and we work with it from that bottom up processing to help them kind of get back into a place where they feel like they can go to that, that feeling of I'm safe enough in this moment for my body to relax and be able to heal. So a lot of your clients are probably seeing say therapists along with seeing you to get like a holistic treatment for themselves. I got you. Right. Uh, I guess I'm, 
I'm kind of curious about, say, um, help in extreme acute situations. Do you ever have recommendations for that? Again, I know it's kind of like individualistic, but like, yeah, say you're having a really hard time and you're you're needing some help and you never feel like anything really works. So you just go down that negative uh, spiral into hell and you're just right. you're just wanting help. And I know a lot of times it's funny as herbalists, like you're you're super good at helping other people, but sometimes in the moment it's it's hard to treat yourself. Um I'm just curious. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I'm just curious <laughs> if you have any um suggestions for folks struggling in the moment. Right. So there are several things. Um, first of all, I mentioned holy basil earlier. Right. It's also known as Tulsi. That is by far one of like my favorites herbs for just if somebody's not sure what will help let's just grab that and see how that does it has a very balancing effect on a lot of people the herb itself has a lot of antioxidant properties to it so you know it just it just tends to be one of those herbs that i grab for first um flower essences which in my mind is a part of herbalism i don't know if everybody agrees with that but flower essences can be a really good place as well Um, There is a Bach remedy. Okay. So there's, this is where I'm I'm about to sound crazy, but it's either distress (laughs) remedy or rescue remedy. Rescue remedy is what I remember. Then distress remedy is the nature sunshine version. (laughs) I was like, uh, anyway, uh, so rescue remedy is the Bach version um, that is really good. A lot of people will use that. They, they make it in liquid form, but then they also have like these little, like kind of hard, pastel type things that you can put under your tongue. Some people really like that. Um, A lot of the times when we are in that kind of downward spiral, there is no top down approach to logicking yourself out of it. And a lot of the times it's a matter of changing what you're doing in that moment. And um, I'm saying this as if I'm an expert in changing what I do in the moment, but (laughs) it's not the case. (laughs) Um, But I have really made an effort since I was traumatized to recognize when I'm starting to spiral and move to a different room or read a book or go get a tea that's a little bit different. So like I have several teas that I keep one of my friends, Ruth Shelton, she goes by the empirical herbalist. She has a really neat collection of teas, one of her teas, which is the Tulsi tea. So it's got holy basil in it. Um, that's one of my favorite to pull out when I'm starting to spiral. So I almost keep it back until I'm having, like, I used to drink it every day and now I'm like, Ooh, but like special occasion tea. Yes. And so I will change the type of tea that I'm drinking. I will change where I'm located. Um, and of course, as many people know, I had long COVID. I'm finally kind of coming out on the other side of it. But for the first few months when I physically couldn't get up and move very much, I would even just change locations in the room. Like I'd walk a few steps to a different chair to give me a slightly different view. Mm -hmm. Um, Getting out and walking in nature is so important. There's research now that indicates that the Schumann resonance, which is the earth's kind of natural resonance um, that's created by the thunderstorms. It peaks at certain times of the day, but it usually stays within a certain range. If we can get out into nature and allow ourselves to be around that resonance a little bit more, it actually has impacts on our heart rate variability. And remember back to the beginning, I mentioned heart rate variability has to do with the vagus nerve and getting back into that ventral vagal state. Mm. So there's a lot of little things that that people can do. Um, I know that that didn't really give a whole lot of plants, but like there are a lot of adaptogens that can be helpful. And David Winston has that wonderful book on adaptogens and um, and nootropics and nervines. And that's a book that if somebody really wants to dig into it, I recommend because there are so many different options. There's Asian ginseng, there's ashwagandha, there's... Um, and now I'm not sure if shatavari is officially defined as an adaptogen by David or not, but like there's all these different plants that are available. And if you can go and read and understand a little bit more about each one of them and then spend a little time connecting with them, if you can't go buy them all, then do what our ancestors did and spend a few moments just connecting with that ethereal, either if you want to call it a plant spirit, I tend to think of them as like a conscious plant spirit, but maybe you're just seeing it more as like a 
a resonance, a vibration to see if it is aligning with your vibration, whatever you want to do with it. A lot of the times we can pick out really good herbs for ourselves when we allow ourselves a chance to really connect like that. Great suggestions. Yeah. And it's hard to go into nature and continue to be in a bad mood. I mean, right. uh, I notice every time I go out and say the woods just instantly calming. So um, very good. I know you also dabble in aromatherapy. Um I'm curious, how can aromatherapy help in the moment? And I know like there's a strong correlation between memory and, and scent and whatnot. And I, I want to say in one of the podcasts uh, I heard you in, you were talking about if you have, if you identify lavender, even though it's a relaxing nervine, if you identify lavender with a highly stressful moment in your life, maybe that's not the best right. scent to be going with, but how, how can aromatherapy help people with trauma and whatnot? Yeah. So I am a certified aromatherapist as well. Um, and one of the things that I've really gotten into is understanding more about the polyvagal theory and aromatherapy. Um, and as a matter of fact, in season two of my podcast, which will be coming out in the next few months, I will be digging more into the aromatherapy side of things since my second book is Essential Oils for Trauma. Um, but one of the things that I tell people is if you're looking at essential oils, which ones do you like the scent of? Like what, which ones are your favorite scents right now? And that can change. Like I have things that I used to really like, and now I'm not as crazy about and mm. vice versa. But like right now, what are the scents that you enjoy that can sometimes lead you to maybe these are the, the essential oils that I need. But what if you don't know, or what if you're just starting out or what if you're just not like, you know, maybe you've tried some things and you're like, these are all weird. I don't really know if I like them. Mm. Polyvagal theory helps there as well. <laughs> um, and, and there's, like I said, there's so much more to this. There's so much more nuance to this, but for the sake of like keeping this from being an eight hour lecture, <laughs> I feel like I'm trying to stick with just kind of like the basics of this polyvagal theory. If somebody is in a dorsal vagal response, remember that's your collapse, your shutdown, everything, the energy has left the building. In that moment, you need essential oils that are energizing and uplifting. So a lot of the times things like um, the citrusy oils, like your sweet orange, your lemon, your mandarin, that kind of thing. Some people really like woodsy type scents, pine, cedar, that sort of thing. Or then we have on the sympathetic side that the, the high energy, right? We've got too much energy in the system, either it's heat or just energy in general, and then we need things that are soothing that can kind of help to bring everything back down. And for some people, this is going to be things like uh, lavender and Lang Lang and um, oh, one of the words is gone. <laughs> there was another one that I was going to mention um, that's interesting. Oh, spearmint. Hmm. So peppermint kind of tends to be a little more energizing, but spearmint has that kind of cooling effect. So there's... And this doesn't work necessarily perfectly for everybody. And this is one of the reasons that I'm always like, you know, there is nuance to it. Neurodivergence can kind of change how that works. Um, and sometimes depending on somebody's underlying traumas, it can flip flop them as well. But for like 80% of the population, that's a good starting point. And like I was mentioning on that podcast, I use lavender as a really good example because a lot of people love lavender, but then there's also a lot of bath products now that are made with lavender. And so there's a lot of children and young adults and maybe older adults, but I, I see a lot of people now who it's almost like if they were in a neglected situation, but there were a lot of lavender products that can actually create a response. And then a lot of childhood trauma leads to that kind of collapse and shutdown because the collapse occurs when we aren't in a position to be able to fight. We can't get out. We can't fight. Our body then turns to that collapse. So if that becomes the common trauma response, which happens for a lot of people who've been through some sort of childhood distress, lavender can actually cause them to feel even more subdued. And that can actually almost create like a, oh, it's a very interesting response. Like, it's almost like 
um, it, you subdued to the point where all of a sudden your body starts trying to rebel and you become almost manic. So like lavender is not perfect for everybody, but there are a lot of people who are in this fight or flight place with all this extra energy. And that lavender really helps to kind of bring them back to a place where they're able to feel safe enough to get into the ventral vagal space. And then of course, sometimes lavender or another essential oil that you love can help you to stay in that ventral vagal space longer. Because one of the things that occurs, I'm getting a little off topic here, but oh, one, no, of the I'm things, following along. <laughs> one of the things that occurs yeah. when you've been through a lot of trauma, especially with complex trauma, is that you don't really have the space to hold feeling safe. The, the, the sense of safe enough is not a space that you're accustomed to holding. It does not feel safe to sit in a space that feels safe. Because your body is still on the lookout for the danger, what's going to happen next, what's going to go wrong. So we really have to start expanding that capacity to stay in that safe enough place. Um, and so the essential oils can really help with that when you find the right one for you. Uh, is First of all, I just want to plug your podcast. I know we'll talk more about it later, but um, Elizabeth has a podcast called The Trauma and for Herbalist. Yes. Uh, you can just search for that in your podcast player of choice uh, and a book along with the same name. So the trauma informed herbalist. Um, but yeah, so I was wondering, say, say you're someone who deals with uh, trauma as we probably, a lot of us do. Um, and you're, you're in one of those downward spirals when you're not say in one of those downward spirals and you're like in a really happy go lucky mood, you're feeling great. Is there a way, do you think you could like, start using aromatherapy like when you're in those good moods start using certain scents like become associating positive moods with this particular scent and then when you're having one of those down moments you're like oh shit i'm gonna run and go get the spearmint now or something like that yes so it's very pavlovian but that's yes. what i was gonna pavlov's dog right <laughs> <laughs> that, that yes but that is that is something i do with some people so like wow. uh, the the thing is is that a lot of people don't necessarily have those good moods that don't have caveats to them. Like if you've got a lot of complex trauma and things like that, but if you are in a place where you do have those downward spirals, but then you have days where you're like, I feel good. Or maybe you've gone into the woods, yeah. right. And you come back out and you're like, yes, I'm in a good place. You can start creating a scent memory association with that. So one of the things that makes aromatherapy so powerful is that when you smell the essential oils or really any scent, but I like focusing on essential oils because there's also physiological benefits to them. But when you smell an essential oil, the scent goes to your olfactory senses, which is directly connected to your limbic system. And the limbic system is the part of your body that really processes that fight or flight response, that sympathetic versus dorsal or ventral vagal. Like that's where it really processes it. So this is a double edged sword, right? We get the wrong scent and it can set off a cascade of stress. But if we get the right scent, it can give a really quick, it can cut to the, to the uh, limbic system and give us a, almost like a shortcut to like feeling back in our body, feeling back where we're like, okay, we're all right now. And so if you are wanting to try this, it's not something you can do one time and call it, call it good. You have to use this for several weeks, find the oil that you like that feels, usually I'm looking for an oil that somebody likes, but they don't really already have a memory attached to the scent. And then once you're done with whatever good thing, you start feeling really good in that moment, take a whiff of the oil. I do this a lot with people in, in yoga. So like we'll do some yoga, they'll start really getting in the flow. They'll start feeling really embodied, really back to where they feel that resilience kind of sensation. And then we'll take a whiff of their blend. And then we do it again the next time. And we do it again the next time. And you do this over and over and over again. And after four or five weeks, you can test it when you are having a spiral and see, okay, I'm having a spiral today. I remembered the essential oil. Sometimes you don't remember. Once you're in a spiral, sometimes it's hard, right? But if, if you remember, go grab it, smell it, and see. See if that's enough to pull you out. I also do this with teas. It's just the essential oils because of that limbic connection tend to be a faster 
response, but teas can do the same thing. Um, and you could do it with tinctures as well. I've just found that teas are very gentle and soothing. And because we have the, the smell of the tea, as well as like the warmth of the cup, you're adding in other senses to it and it makes it for a really good embodiment practice as well. Uh, have you ever heard the the Mike Tyson quote? I want to say if I'm not butchering this, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And uh, I, you were talking and I, for some reason that came up. I'm like, I have all these plans that I'm going to do before I have my like freak out episodes or whatever. Right. And I'm right. like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to be so good next time. And I'm <laughs> But, right. um, but listening to you inspires me. I'm like, shit, I really want to get to the point where I'm like, I do want to train my brain to associate certain sense with, uh, you know, positive feelings and right. give it a go. Cause, um, it, yeah, I, I still smell certain synthetic perfumes that remind me of, um, safe spaces when I was a child. Uh, and, and it's, even though it's not like legitimate plant essential oils, it's hyper synthetic and, uh, probably, you know, bad for you or whatever. I just, I'm just like, I have these, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Just thinking about it. And, um, yeah, it's scent is a very, very powerful thing. And, um, uh, I would like to learn more about your shift summit class coming up, uh, here in a few, I'm not sure if it's a involved with aromatherapy or not, but, um, yeah, before we get onto that though, I did yeah. want to say that, while I do use essential oils most frequently and I prefer the more natural stuff, I do have some people who like I had one woman that it was a shampoo and that was what she used to help her get back. And, and it was an external resource is what we call it when we're trying to process through some of the nervous system things. And we used that for a little while until we found the right essential oil. So like those synthetic fragrances can be a stopgap. We just don't want to use them long term. But like, it's a thing. And, and you say this, there's a meme going around on Facebook right now about cucumber, melon, bath and body works. Oh, and people are joking about like the, the scent, the team Japanese cherry blossom or team, whatever the others were. And like, it's very strong. Like that, that scent profile is very strong for people. And like, I was Japanese cherry blossom as a kid. <laughs> and, but like, and so like, there are people, they see that cucumber melon and it instantly brings them back. For me, it's the cherry blossom. Like there, and it's a very strong thing. And so if you are in a place where it's like, I don't have the essential oils yet, or I don't know yet what's going to work. And you do have a, a, a scent of a, you know, shampoo or something that, that does help. You can start with that and then you can slowly make your steps over to the essential oils. That is an option. Um, so I did want to just like mention that again, yes, synthetic, we don't want to be on it forever, but if that's where we can start to get somebody back to a place where they feel like they have the energy to get into a better spot, then that's where we start. So Great points. And I, I actually have been meaning to underline the, the whole uh, example you gave about how lavender is on all these different body care products. And you could, someone could start associating that with like, say a bad home life. And then it, then their recall is, uh, you know trauma and whatnot. And I'd never thought of that before. You're right though. There's so many products out there that have lavender scent in it and just could be this negative association. But, um, yeah, thank you for, uh, teaching us about aromatherapy and whatnot. I know another one of your specialties is, um, I want to say somatics. Um, so can you explain what somatic plant medicine practice is before we kind of uh, get into your shift network stuff? Yes. So somatic plant medicine practices are essentially combining somatics with what the plants are doing for your body. Somatics comes from the Greek word soma, which is body. And the idea is, is that when we listen to the body, when we are noticing the sensations, not just the emotions, but the underlying sensations that tell us what those emotions are, then we are in a place where we're starting to decode the language of our nervous system. And like I said at the beginning, the nervous system is usually that root cause of imbalance after trauma. And so if we can start listening to the nervous system through somatics work, then we can start figuring out what we need, what will work best for us while we're trying to heal. Plant medicine gives us great external resources and gives us a lot of support that allows us to get into the ventral vagal space better. 
So when I say external resource, we have external resources and we have internal resources. Internal resources would be like a good memory of a good event. And then the sensations that come up for us and being able to really like latch on to those sensations. External resources are going to be like a fuzzy blanket that feels really nice. Or in the case of essential oils, a smell that we really love. And why, why I love essential oils, again, there's, there's phytochemicals in those oils that when we inhale, they absorb through the mucous membranes into our bloodstream. So we're also getting a physiological response from that where there's actually like the linalol or the linalol acetate or whatever else gets into our body helps our body to go, oh, okay, we can relax a little bit now. We can feel a little bit more soothed. And so those external resources, things like the essential oils or maybe a physical tactile thing that feels nice or a tea or, you know, the right spice blend, whatever that looks like, those things can help us when the internal resources aren't there yet. Or when the internal resources are there, but maybe we're already feeling overwhelmed and those resources have shrunk a little bit and they're not as strong as they might be on a better day. The other reason that I really love plants for somatic work is that every time I work with a plant, I get a consistent response. Mm. Humans are a lot more mercurial and there is, I'm, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. So I love my plants. I love being in my garden, but I love my humans too. And there is a time and a place for that. Right. But sometimes what is so necessary is for us to have something that we know when we work with this we're going to have the same resonance every time. Whereas I might call my best friend and if she's had a bad day at work, our resonance isn't going to be there. And I may feel like I need to be able to be in a safe place as she's over here needing to be able to vent about whatever's happened at her job. And so when we're going through a lot, especially when we're in one of those downward spirals or maybe we're first starting to kind of climb back out of the trauma, because what happens is usually when you're going through it, you're making it, you're okay, you're okay. And then the moment your body realizes that you're actually safe enough to begin the healing process, that's when it breaks down. <laughs> like that's when it gets bad. Having the consistent connection with your plant allies can really help to bring a sense of like, okay, I am safe enough. I am in a place where I can be a little bit more soothed so that I can begin the healing process. And sometimes we can get that from, from friends and family, but if we're really raw, it may not be a place where that reciprocal relationship with the friends and family is, is going to work. And that's where plants can come into play. So that's a lot of the work that I've been doing. And that's kind of, um, that's a good portion of, of what we're getting into with the shift network class. Awesome. Do you see uh, clients uh, virtually? Yes. Awesome. How, uh, if someone was listening and they're like, I like the somatic stuff, I like your aromatherapy stuff, and they want to work with you, how would someone get a, a hold of you uh, to work with you? If you go to traumainformedherbalist.com and you scroll down, there's a button that says work with me one on one. That will take you to the page that gives you a little bit more description about what I do. I work on a month to month basis. So instead of paying me per session, you pay me for the month. And then we schedule what you need. We work together virtually or in person, depending on where you are. And it's a month to month service. So it's not like you're committed for six months. We just work together as you need. And yeah. It's probably hard to teach yoga online. It's really not that bad. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you do that so, too? Yes. So oh, wow. now it would be if it would be if we were trying to get into a lot of the more um advanced poses i could see where that might be a problem but the asana is only one limb of yoga yoga is actually just as much about the philosophy as it is the physical practice and so a lot of the physical practices i do tend to be more gentle in nature anyway because once you've been through trauma or a lot of people i work with have autoimmune issues that that were activated by going through something severe emotionally and you don't want to overwork your body 
when you're dealing with that. So a lot of the stuff that I do is like chair yoga or gentle yoga flows. We don't get into a lot of like, we're not doing like headstands and things like that. Uh, we're less about twisting into pretzels <laughs> and more about, I mean, in, you know, legit, if that's what you want to sure. do, go for it. Yeah. But yeah. we're less about that and more about trying to notice what our body's asking for today. Do I need to use props to help me to get to a place where I really feel like I'm, you know, my breath is flowing well and I feel strong in this moment um, instead of trying to achieve what can be beautiful poses. But a lot of the times, and again, like I'm not trying to like put anybody down who loves that kind of thing, but like a lot of the times for those of us who are not naturally like willowy and don't necessarily get into those poses easily. A lot of the times the spirit of yoga is lost trying to achieve something that is, is Instagram worthy. Um, so yeah, a lot of the yoga I do is very gentle. It's very different than, than trying to like use it as a sport. I like your approach. That's my speed to, um, also, I appreciate your vocab. You said mercurial and willowy. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I read uh, a lot as a kid. It paid off. <laughs> I, uh, I love it. <laughs> well, um, why don't you tell us about the the Shift Network uh, course that you're teaching? I just want to say we've uh, collaborated uh, with numerous Shift uh, classes over the years now, and uh, we're going to promote yours as well. But um, yeah, why don't you tell the audience about it? Yeah. So it's uh, the first thing that we're doing is a free online event. It's a workshop that's an hour long. It's coming up on, oh no, August 5th. Let me check my calendar. Yeah. I believe it's... Do. Sounds, sounds about right to me. <laughs> sounds right. Let me double check, make sure I'm telling you guys right. You also have like a free webinar associated with it, right? Yes. Or... That, that yeah. is the, the free. Yeah. That's the thing. Okay. Cool. That's the free. Yeah. August 5th. Okay. is the the free webinar and it's an hour long and I've already recorded it. It's super, like, I am very excited for this to release. We talk a lot about tapping into different plant allies and getting into some of the more like somatic side of things. Like when I'm using um, a plant that I could use several different parts of the plant, noticing how one part affects me differently than another. So like mimosa, which down here mm -hmm. we have Albizia julibrisson, and we use both the bark and the flowers. And the bark gives a different feel from the flowers. And so like just being able to kind of like touch in with your body and noticing what's occurring when you're using different parts of the plant, as well as different plants. We go into that a little bit. And then there's a quick visualization. It's about a 10 to 12 minute guided visualization that starts and ends with a little bit of somatics. And then we take a trip to gain a little bit of more insight from a plant ally. Lovely. Well, we'll uh, include a link to that in the podcast description, YouTube description and whatnot. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this interview, which I'm really loving it, Elizabeth, this was uh, so, so many valuable takeaways. I'm, I'm excited to edit this. So I got to re-listen to it Yeah, <laughs> further ingrain the knowledge into my brain, but, um, we still got a few minutes. If you have time for some more questions. Sure. Let's do it. Awesome. Um, I want to say, I heard you reference uh, a book called the body keeps the score, which I know is uh very popular. Um, I was wondering if you could either describe it or, do you ascribe to it? And um, do you have any other recommended resources uh, kind of along the same lines of what we're talking about today? Body Keeps the Score is a very interesting book. If you have a lot of trauma, it may or may not be a good book for you to read. The Body Keeps the Score is uh, the author is best, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. And it is pretty much the, the book that starts this whole thing, right? Like this is the book that got people realizing how much their body is holding these traumas or these events. You know, I know we use trauma a lot and I know a lot of people kind of feel like Ugh, trauma is so overused, but I think there's a lot more trauma in the world than people realize a lot of the times. But even if you don't see yourself as having a lot of trauma, maybe you've just been through a lot of, of difficult situations, or maybe there's been a lot of trials in your life. And then noticing where you're holding that in your body, 
Dr. Van der Kolk is the first person that really popularized that idea. It's been there, right? I mean, even indigenous practices, when you look at a lot of the, the older practices that come from ancient, you know, all over the world, right? I, I'm thinking of Celtic practices that I know from friends who are, are pagan and into that kind of thing. And um, and then, of course, you have your your Native American practices and things coming from you know traditional Chinese medicine. But we have that already. But Dr. Van der Kolk really popularized it in the more conventional stream, as it were, of con- stream of consciousness. We'll call it that. Um, and it's a good thing. But the book itself has a lot of really activating um, discussions and it was written for clinicians. Oh, yes. So I'm not saying don't go read it, (laughs) but um, if you find yourself being activated by it, there are several other options. We don't have to stick with just the body keeps the score. So, for instance, I don't even know if it's going to be backwards or not. Oh, it's not. No, it's not. Looks great. (laughs) This is The Deepest Well by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. And it's talking about childhood trauma specifically, but this is a really fantastic book um, that I feel like is a little bit more gentle. I mean, there there is still some, it is a little bit clinical, but it doesn't have the same harsh effect as some of Dr. Van der Kolk's um, stories do. Because you have to remember when he was writing that, he was writing it to really try to impress upon people how severe this was. Um, And so some of the stories in there are just very activating for some people. Uh, so anyway, that is that's an option. There's also another book if you're really interested in this kind of thing and you want to get into some exercises. Deb Dana has polyvagal exercises for safety and connection. This is a really good one that's got several different exercise options in it. She even talks about um, like going outside and noticing repeatable patterns. Uh, so the like the trees and things like that, fractal patterns. That's the word. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she talks about that. Um, I also like to call them predictable patterns because even the birds around you, like if you can hear the birds and hear their songs, if you sit out long enough, you can kind of catch what they're going to do next, Mm -hmm. right? You're going to, you can kind of catch when you expect them to sing again, when you expect them to make whatever noise they're making again. Um, And Dr. Peter Levine has some books. He has the um in an unspoken voice is my favorite one now he has waking the tiger which is the more popular one but his newer one in an unspoken voice i think is a very wonderful option for people to read to understand a little bit more about how trauma works and and how the body is holding it i will leave links to those in the show notes uh thank you for sharing and when you say the body keeps the score uh you're saying that if someone is highly triggered by having extreme trauma from childhood, it might be a, a not wise to read that book because it could just be too triggering or something like that. Yeah, not even necessarily from childhood. Like he he describes war crimes. I see. And doesn't condemn them. Um, and I have heard people say that that really activated them. I was activated by a couple of the things that that the soldiers admitted to doing. I see. Um, And it didn't bother me so much that he didn't condemn it because it is written for clinicians, but just like I got a real strong visualization of what happened. So there are there are situations where you start reading the book and you may be like, "Ooh, this is a little too much. It's okay to put it down. But my main thing is, is if you want to read it, go read it. And a lot of people, it has really helped them. Like it is a very good book. So again, this is like 80% of the population is really going to think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is fantastic. But if you've been through certain types of trauma and you start getting activated by it, you're not broken. It's just that book is very direct and very forward. And there are other options. And I really like, really love Dr. Harris's book, this, the deepest well, like, I really love this one. I think it's, um, I, she, she is, she's just very well spoken. And, and like the, the book is compared to some of the um, other books that I've read on trauma that get a little bit more vivid on things. She has figured out a real good way to approach some of this stuff that's helpful while also, you know, touching. So I definitely love her stuff. I'll see if she's got it on audio. 
Uh, yes. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll I'll for sure leave links to those in the show notes. Well, uh, like I said, this has been a super jam packed episode. I'd like to kind of lighten it up a little bit and get to know Elizabeth a little bit more. Um, so just a couple random questions. Uh, yeah. uh, what is a random hobby of yours outside of all this stuff that we talked about today? A random hobby. Yeah. Um, I love archery. I'm cool. kind of good at it. Yeah. Wow. That's <laughs> so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big fan of it. And I, I am one of these people that I don't like the, uh, oh no, words are gone again. Re- yeah. Recurve. Is it the recurve? No compound. I don't like oh. compound bows where you can pull it and hold it. I like my recurve that, that doesn't have the, the, um, the pulleys on it. Um, because to me, part of the art is learning how to hold that tension while aiming where you lose that with the compound. Cause like you pull it back. Yeah. But then it releases the tension while you're trying to aim. So I, anyway, so that's like, you're doing it like the old school method then. Yeah. Like the, yeah. yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, do you go to like the range and whatnot and shoot at targets or. So when we lived in Pelham, Oak Mountain State Park had an archery range. That's so cool. Uh, yeah, we don't really have anything here, but I, I have, I've loved that for years. Uh, when I was a kid at a camp, I got into it, and then right after that, Lord of the Rings came out, and of course, <laughs> this was like my best friend. I was like, sure. yes. So <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, we'll do a random question from the Let's Get Deep Friends edition. Yeah. Uh, as per tradition, Let's see what we got here. Oh. This is appropriate. Uh, what was the last book you read? Oh, no. Um, Gray Mountain, I think. Now, let me Google it. It's a John Grisham novel. My husband's finally turned me on to Grisham. Wow. Um, He's prolific. Yeah. I, I just know. I don't know. Like, I'm I I guess I fancy myself. I don't know artsy but <laughs> i never got into him sure. but no uh gray mountain is the name of the novel and it's really interesting because it's about um it's about a it's about the 2008 crash right and the woman was a lawyer in new york and she moves down to i want to say somewhere in virginia it might have been west virginia and she's fighting the companies that are strip mining the appalachian mountains um so it really has like hit you know, like, Ooh, but yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a really, I loved it. It was a really interesting book. So, so you read both fiction on and nonfiction. I take it. Yes. Now for nonfiction, cause that's probably what people are actually interested in. Let me think for a <laughs> second. What was the last thing I read? Um, I saw you got two books. You got one. Maybe this was an older post, uh, Kat Myers, uh, energetic herbalism book. Yes. And then, um, then some and other one. I forgot. Love but... nature magic by oh, Maria. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Energetic herbalism is one that I've been reading because I'm going to uh, do an article for the American Herbalist Guild. Oh. I also just finished uh, Pascal Baudar's Wild Crafted Vinegars. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've, I've heard yes. of him. I, th- I think we might even be friends on Facebook. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but oh, yeah, he seems like a rad dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's really interesting because a lot of his of course, I think this is common for like the um, the the fermentation communities but a lot of his his work in this book is like a call to action to look around us at the local area and see what we have that can be fermented into you know either from like uh, traditional ferments or like more the vinegar type things yeah. um and of course he's in this book he's using like all kinds of cool stuff to make the weirdest relishes yeah. and like at one point he talks about how he used he captured fruit flies to make a mother from because they have certain bacteria that are really beneficial for humans. And so he like, and of course, you know, by the time it's done, it's not like you're eating fruit flies. Right. But (laughs) really interesting. So yeah, definitely, definitely a fan of that book. Very cool. I bet the photography is pretty, pretty good at the book too. Yeah. Yes. He's always got the best pictures, but, um, awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time today and, um, your, your vulnerability, and your just ability to teach. Um, I highly recommend the audience go check out this shift network class that Elizabeth is teaching. Um, and again, let's plug your, uh, your book and your, um, your podcast. Yeah. So one more thing on the shift network class, oh, sure. this yeah. is a free workshop, but then after the workshop, there is a seven week series where we're diving really in depth into, nice. you know, um, the nervines and adaptogens, which are two different types of herbs that help with the nervous system, and then some flower essences and some essential oils really trying to help you to 
learn about the different things that I see be useful for people. And so that you can connect to the ones that are really your plant allies. So definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, and yes, my, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, um, the Trauma Informed Herbalist podcast was created to kind of parallel my first book, The Trauma Informed Herbalist. And I'm going to come out with a second season this fall called it's going to be the season two is going to be on essential oils for trauma because my second book is <laughs> essential oils for trauma. Uh, so I'm kind of just uh, as I release a book, I'll do a season that kind of parallels the book and maybe digs into some stuff we didn't get into the final edits. Um, yeah. And then again, the books are the both of the books are out and available. And I have been honored by the response I've received from people about the material. And in my mind, it's less about me saying, here are all the things you need to do. And more about here's a call to action because I am one slice of experience. And trauma is pervasive and everybody's experience is unique and different. And if I can help you see, especially now, like we're kind of coming out of the, the chaos of the last few years, everybody's trying to kind of like reorient to where we are now. And if we can use this time to really kind of take charge and say, okay, I've been through a lot. I've got a lot of stuff going on. Here's how I'm going to like adjust my plan so that I come out a little bit more healed so that then I can turn to my neighbor and start to help them however they need help so that then our communities can start to rebuild so that we can really come out stronger. Like this is the time to do it. I love your mission, Elizabeth. Uh, it's great work. And I also really love uh, your style of podcasting. I think that's neat that you're doing a season per book. I guess you got a lot of books in you. Um, I'm so working we'll, on the third one now. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, is that does that have to do with somatics or? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Starting to head in that direction. It's a. It right now. It's the working title is Earth's Embrace, uh, and it's a guide to connecting with plant al allies through embodiment practices. Love it. Uh, yeah, you mentioned um, the feedback for the trauma informed herbalist has been really positive, and I've actually seen that publicly as well. I did want to say you publicly shared a bad review that you got, which I thought was hilarious. Um, someone said, uh, "I already know all this stuff," and I'm like, "Well, <laughs> that's such a Bless shitty." I, I I don't know. I thought the whole thing was super funny, and you just kind of owned it. And you know, I, yeah, we we've gotten some <laughs> negative comments now on the YouTube channel and whatnot. And I'm like, I guess that means, you know, we're, we're getting out there. We're putting ourselves out there. Not everyone's going to like everything we do. So, but yeah, it's it was trauma. Funny. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and I was just like, I saw that and I thought, I really want to meet this. Per I mean, like, I, you know, I know that <laughs> yeah. to some extent they're probably brushing some of my stuff off. Right. But like, right. if they really have that, like in depth of a knowledge, I sure. really want to meet them and just like, chew the cud with them about stuff. Right. <laughs> like, if somebody else has all of this in this way, like I want to have that conversation with you, but it was funny because the other piece to that review, they were like, I already know all of this stuff. And then they were like, <laughs> and then I tried to send the book back and, and they told me to keep it. And then they had like the shrug emoji, like, Meh. and I was just like, I don't even know what to make of this. Like, I'm sorry. You had to keep the book. <laughs> you got your refund. I, just give it to someone who doesn't know everything. Right. Stick uh, it in a little library, like one of those little yeah. public library things or something like it'll be all right. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you once again, Elizabeth, for joining us on the Herbalist Hour. Any uh, closing thoughts before we get out of here? I, I really honored to be here. And I, I just want to say that like this work again, like in my mind, I don't own this, right? I mean, I own my herbal somatics protocol, but as far as like trying to connect with plant allies and really trying to understand the trauma-informed side of things and understand how we can be more compassionate towards each other and towards ourselves, to me is so important. Um, and I see a lot of people that that struggle with that, that really struggle with like finding that compassion. And I struggle with it some days. Like I really struggle to be compassionate with myself. And if you can find ways to really connect with the plants and to tap into that deeper sense of longing that we all have, almost that homesickness that occurs sometimes, if we can find ways to relate to the plants and connect with nature around us so that we're able to really pinpoint 
how to how to act and how to respond when we're starting to feel those sensations of not belonging or um, being out of our depth or spiraling down, like you mentioned, then we will go a long way towards healing. Well said. Well, thank you once again, Elizabeth. And thanks to y'all for listening to yet another episode of the Herbalist Hour. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's JOIN to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.